I've actually had more fun with the Soval Zero than most other printers I've played with recently. And I have to say, Soval is a brand that I really do want to champion. You see, when it comes to budget printer brands, that usually means us having numerous printer companies copy the most expensive brands, but having fewer and cheaper components or a reduced quality of life workflow. And that's not a bad thing. It saves us money when we're on a budget. However, those cost reductions often result in a less reliable product and sometimes more headaches. What I like about Soval is they're kind of going in their own direction, a direction that people like Prusa are going. They aren't being shy about what these printers are, and they are now fully leaning into their printers being mostly pre-assembled Voron machines, which, by the way, is an open-source 3D printing design platform truly flying the flag of RepRap still in 2025. If you don't know some of those words, please Google them. I'm not covering it here. It's too deep a rabbit hole. But I have to say that what we have here, despite its very limited size, is a printer that I genuinely have had an awesome time with. And despite this being aimed at a more tinkerer crowd, as a home hobbyist user, User, dare I say it? Yeah, I dare. This is actually more feature-packed than a Prusa Core 1. So after dropping that bombshell, all that's left to say is hi, I'm Ross and this is Fohammer Videos. Right, first off, unboxing and assembly. Actually, no, let's skip unboxing. You take it out of the box, which is easy to do because it's small and light. Assembly is straightforward, not the easiest, it's pretty easy, but I mean straightforward specifically thanks to its pretty decent instruction manual. All you have to do is attach the screen to the cables sticking out the front, which are clearly labelled which one goes in which socket, attach the filament reel holder on the back, the runout sensor off the side, feed the included PTFE tube through the printer into the hot end, attach the Wi-Fi antenna, turn it on, let it run through its calibration, and it's ready to print. However, I want to dive straight into the issues I've had with this printer, and the main ones I want to call out are on the externals. First of all, the port placement. The power socket and rocker switch are on the left-hand side of the machine, which leaves you with this big bulky cable sticking out. So for those of you, like most of us in the UK, this takes up a little extra horizontal real estate on worktops that we could fill by, you know, sitting another device up close. And on the right side of the machine at the back, you've got a similar issue because this is where the ports are for Ethernet, USB, and HDMI. Now those first two ports are obvious, but the latter port is actually used to connect up an option touchscreen UI that doesn't come as standard, but we'll come on to UI separately. And as previously mentioned, the Wi-Fi antenna sticks off the right-hand side too. But none of these things have functional impact, they're mostly just untidy elements. What I'm unhappy, happy, unhappy with, that'll make sense in a mo, is the filament holder and runout sensor mounting locations. So the filament spool holder is on the back, which I've complained about on other printers, so I don't like this generally. But because it's on the back right side, I can still easily access it to change filament spools which is something I do like. However, it's the runout sensor positioning that makes this difficult because when actually loading the filament, you need to give the printer an awkward reach around. I don't know if there is one that isn't awkward, just maybe don't stare directly in the printer's eyes as you're doing it. Anyway, when you do this, you have to pull the filament line clumsily into the runout sensor towards yourself. Now, thankfully, Aurora Tech, another great YouTube channel, has designed a whole new mount for this that will hang off the side. And if if you want a more technical review of this machine, please check out her channel because, as I said, it is awesome. I'm more about the overall user experience side of things, though it's still nice to see that we've both come to a very similar conclusion. Anyway, as I was saying, I don't like the mounting location for the filament, I do like that it's accessible, and I don't like the runout sensor positioning. Thankfully, it's moddable, and that's some of what you should expect with Soval machines. They are targeted at the more projecty based user anyway. And on the plus side, and I wish we saw this more, right where the PTFE tube enters the printer, there is a PTFE tube coupler. So for anyone wanting to use an external filament dryer, for example, this is an ideal consideration that other brands don't often do. Now, as I said, the build of this machine is based on the Voron Zero, which is something you can build yourself if you check out Voron's website. This is based on a Zero kit, with the framework being made up of aluminium extrusion, the body's also aluminium sheets, with the door and lid both being made out of glass. 
and the lid also has these small plastic latches in each corner unlike other machines, though I suspect this is to stop the lid shifting as the loose PTFE tube shifts internally. Now you could attach this tube to the hot ends cable chain, but this loose method prevents the sharp angle that the filament needs to overcome in the last few centimeters before entering the extruder gear a problem on a few other machines. I think the key thing to be aware of in this machine, in case it wasn't already obvious, is that it is tiny in terms of build volume. It's only 152.4 by 152.4 with a build height of 152.5. I'm not sure why that extra tenth of a millimeter was even worth developing. And it's got a two-sided PEI plate, which you can guide into place using two tabs at the back of the build platform. Though there's no horizontal guidance tabs, but this is small enough to easily maneuver without them. And it's even got an integrated nozzle wiper, which is handy for pre-print cleaning. But yeah, this is the smallest FDM printer I've ever used, smaller even than the Bamboo A1 Mini. And I did struggle with it as the project I built on this machine for this video, another one of Tame Grip's prop weapons, had to have about 30% of the parts printed on a different, larger printer. But I'll come back to showing you the rest of this build as I go through my conclusion. Anyway, this has got some cool features. There's a part cooling blade fan across the rear of the printer, and that brings air in across the part. And at the lower back corner is an exhaust fan to get hot air out of the chamber. There's also a magnetic cover to put over this when using more potentially hazardous materials like ABS. When this cover's in place, the air won't be exhausted straight out, but it'll actually be forced to pass over a carbon filter in the top of this unit beforehand. Just remember to move it before printing with PLA. I forgot at one point and ended up with a couple of extruder jams before I remembered. But at least this lets me talk about and show off maintenance on this printer. The hot end cover is easily removable thanks to its clips and swapping out the nozzle is just three screws. And if you need to access the extruder as I did, it's just two extra screws to disconnect the controller board and then unscrew the nut from the extruder tension arm to access the filament. Once you've done that, this was enough clearance for me to cut out the material that had deformed in the extruder due to the excess heat, pop it all back together and continue printing. And I really wish more brands would give us this much access to the extruder mechanism as it's one of the more frustrating issues to tackle. Much like a paper jam on 2D printers, I can't see us ever eradicating this potential problem, so it would be good to see brands lean into it with better ways to resolve it. Just it being more accessible here makes this one of the better ones in my humble opinion. Now, one of the other features where this offers functionality beyond even the Prusa Core 1 is the inclusion of a webcam. Now, I understand why Prusa left it as an optional extra, but I personally like these both for using in my videos that I put out, but also remote monitoring and post-print issue diagnosis. Though, I have to say, the image quality here is awful. It's both low resolution and the footage is really noisy. And this isn't in low light conditions either. The printer has a built-in chamber light, but I also had my studio lights pointed right at it. One thing I did notice is that the machine has no tangle detection. At one point, I thought I had another clog, even though I'd removed the internal fan Cover, but it turns out I'd actually gotten my filament snagged. That's my bad and it happens. Feel free to complain at me about this if you've never made a mistake. To err is human, but by that logic, I'm probably human more often than most. Anyway, it would have been nice if this printer could have detected this and paused, but sadly, no. Maybe that's a mod you could do. Moving on to the UI, this is as basic as they come. In fact, it's more basic than most come now. There's no touch screen here, just a monochrome screen filled with lists of functions and a control dial that has three functions, turn clockwise or counterclockwise and push in to click. This is a rather legacy interface for modern printers, but it is workable in the most part. And again, if you want, you can install a clipper interface touchscreen that Sovol sell. I guess if I do another Sovol review, I might actually ask them for one of these to try out. Now, I say it's workable, but I do still find some of these functions a bit limited. For example, when changing filament, the only options are load or unload, with no direct way to set the extrusion length. So when I was changing colors, it had often extrude to an amount that was always not quite a full color change, leading me to have to go all the way back into this function from the home menu and do it again. At least until I realized you can quickly manually extrude some more before the nozzle cooled by just turning the gear on the back of the hot end unit. 
And yeah, it took me longer than it should have to figure out why there was no extrude function on the UI when I was dealing with the clogs I had until I realized I didn't need one because there's a big bloody valve on the back. Another strange thing is connecting to Wi-Fi. It's odd here. Now, when you get the printer, or at least in my case and how it should be when you get it, it was in its factory reset state. To pass this, you need to run the out-of-box calibration, such as leveling and resonance detection, the usual stuff. You also need to do this after a firmware update too, which I was pleased to see as available as an over-the-air update rather than a manual download to an external USB drive. But for how smart that is, Wi-Fi, yeah, you need to actually open a config file on the root of the USB drive, enter your Wi-Fi's ID and password in here, save it, plug that USB drive into the printer and restart it. Then you need to go into the menus and I think advanced and click and then show IP on the printer in order for it to then save and hold those credentials so it can connect. It's really janky and I'd at least like the option of being able to do this in the UI. Overall though, it's a passable and workable interface, but other brands with similar interfaces have shown much cleaner workflows where the user in real world scenarios has been considered a lot more. But again, I kind of want to expect stuff like this from a machine like this. And finally, the slicer. And this, I think is the main thing I love about Sovol. There's no pissing about with Sovol Slicer or any of that crap that they've made and branded. They don't have one. They literally just ship this with Orca. Now, in my version, because I had this printer sent to me for free pre-release, I had to manually add the profiles and muck around with files on my PC. But if you download the latest version of Orca now, this machine and its profiles should be there. Though they were limited to nothing more than 0.2 millimeter height profiles per generic material type. And what I love about Orca is the fact that, well, we know it, we understand it, we know where everything is. The only thing that's even slightly different is the more detailed interface in Orca for monitoring the printer. This is the web interface. And it is a bit weird because if you want to download the time lapses from this interface, you actually need to access the printer via this interface in its web UI, which is basically the same UI, but you type the IP address into a web browser. Otherwise, you can't download time lapses through Orca. But anyway, there's no Sovol Cloud app, but you can monitor it remotely using the open source Obico app, which they actually recommend in the instruction manual. Again, though, overall, I actually want to thank Sovol for doing what we want from most other brands and just giving us Orca on the USB stick. So now then, as the first part of the conclusion, printing. My first print was the built-in Benchy test, and as this was printing, this moved faster than any printer I've ever seen before in person. I think the audio of this clip actually has me exclaim F in hell as I stood there watching the whole thing print, mesmerized by how fast it was going. But as for quality, well, I've said this so often now that I'm getting a bit sick of it. The faster the print, in most cases, the worse the quality. And here, it's not great, with warped walls, low detail, and gaps in the upper surfaces. The Benchy I printed later using the profile in the slicer took closer to 30 minutes and is visually much better. However, when it comes to overall print speed, there is a little bit of time saved here in how long it takes for everything to get ready because the nozzle and the small bed heat up incredibly fast. And the printer also does its leveling detection through what is called an eddy current sensor. So instead of it touching all the various points of the bed, this just quickly scans over the surface and gets to printing. And as for how accurate that is, well, I ran a first layer test on this and it came off pretty decent. Not the best, but well, this was my experience with pretty much all the prints. It was just a little sub okay out of the box. And I do need to say that with all my prints, this is loud. And this is the case fan and airflow noise more than anything. Something I've pointed out with the Soval SV08 and many users of that printer actually made it their first task to change to quieter fans. I think the same can be said and should be done here. And one annoyance that I think needs a firmware update is that every time I finished a print, the external case fan would just spin eternally. It never went off, at least not in the eight hours I tested it for. It did seem to resolve this after I did a firmware update, but three or four prints later, it just kept spinning forever again following every print. Bit weird. 
Anyway, the overall out-of-box quality of prints on this weren't amazing. A lot of what I printed for my large project weren't super accurate, and there were times that I struggled to fit some parts together and it needed some minor filing and cutting. A lot of the test prints I did showed signs of stringing, and on the toaster test, I couldn't actually move the 0.2 centimeter clearance pin that I typically can on similar machines I've tested recently. But where I can accept that more here than on other printers is that this printer is kind of made to be a project machine. It's built on the Voron framework, which is an open source approach to printing aimed more at tinkerers. So whilst Soval can, and yeah, to a degree, should look at dialing in their profiles a little better for people who want an out of box workhorse, which would attract more customers. I think the reason to buy one of these is more if you want to get into the tech of 3D printing while starting a little further up learning curve mountain. Unlike a Voron, the machine here is built for you, so you can print out of the box. If you get a Voron and you don't know what good looks like when building your first printer, you can only really be frustrated at the platform or blame yourself. And no offense, it's probably not the platform. So having something that is built for you that shows you what good looks like is a fantastic place to start, even if you do want to build one of your own in the future. But once you've got this built machine, yeah, you'll probably need to dial in some settings like temperature, flow rate, retraction, and speed. But most of these are tests built into Orca now anyway. Once you've done that and you're confident in the machine, you can then work backwards and start to tinker with the hardware. And as I said, there are things here that I personally like over the Prusa Core 1. It's got things I want, like the blade fan at the back, the nozzle wiper, and integrated camera, all features that suit me as a home user. You don't get them with Prusa. Not right now, anyway. So overall, this surprisingly impressed me. This is a feature rich, mighty little beast and a printer I've got no qualms recommending to the right people. If you're after a plug and play printer, there are cheaper, larger machines out there. But if you want a printer to really have some fun with, I've had more fun with this than most others and with no brand bullshit to wade through on the journey. If you do decide to pick one of these up, then please consider clicking my affiliate links down in the description before you do. I'll make a commission on that click at no cost to you. I wanna say thank you for watching with a huge thanks going to our members. Please consider joining them. That's another way to support us. You'll get your name up in lights along with early access, exclusive videos, and roles on our Discord server. So until next time, let off some steam, Bennett. Fohammer out.